talking about what major topic lately? Babylon, past, present, future. When we talked about Babylon, what are several key things we kept in mind as we studied Babylon? Confusion. Is that what you said, Mom? Yeah. Confusion. So we see that God's kind of comes, but before Babylon, we're looking at a world that was more likely Oh, well, it didn't have as many mountains. It didn't have canyons. It was before the flood. So when we look at this tower battle, everything there is uh, an entirely new environment for them. So they are experiencing the world as those before them had not known it. Mountains, canyons, rain from the sky. How many languages were there? There was only one language. Does anybody know what that language was? English. English. Because English is the dominant language. No. Really, when it gets down to it, we don't know what language it was. People can speculate, but the Bible doesn't say it. We don't know. We also see there, there um, at Babel, we get a model for the worship centers throughout the world. And what I mean by that is the formation of, uh, and the architectural structure of the ziggurat. We see it reflected in the pyramids of Egypt. We see it reflected in the pyramids of the Aztecs and the Incas. And we also once again see that their worship, or place of worship, is dead center of their civilization. It is dead center of the city. Now we are going to move on and talk about Babylon. Babel being the foundation, now we're progressing. And when we look, we talked last week about Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And we stated that there were two key dates in the history of the Jews. Does anybody remember what those dates are? They are in your notes, so if you didn't write them down. Two key dates in the history of the Jews. Six zero six, six hundred and six. And why is that date important? Because that is marking the beginning of the times of the Gentiles. Before this, Israel were, was a ruling nation. They were on their own. But because of their sin of idolatry, God sent them into exile. 606 marks the times when the Gentiles began ruling over Israel. We see Nebuchadnezzar coming in, taking over. And the times of the Gentiles extend to even our present time. Israel might be a nation, but they have not gained their, and I hate, for lack of better terminology, their independence from God or in God. They are still under the rule of thumb of the Gentiles. They are not completely free. Yes, they are a nation, but once again, they are not free from the Gentiles ruling completely over them. Can anyone tell me the second date? Nineteen forty-eight. And if I remember correctly, it should be May tenth, nineteen forty-eight. Why is May 10th, 1948, a date that the Jews won't forget? Or why is it important to them? Why is it one of their key dates? From 606 BC all the way to 1948 AD, the, Gentile, the 
Jews did not have their homeland. They were completely under the rule of the thumb of the Gentiles. And it all goes back to Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. When we look at Babylon, Babylon played a tremendous role in the history of the Jews. We just mentioned about how the Jews became under the thumb of the Gentiles. This marked the beginning of the dispensation, the dispensation, the times of the Gentiles, and it began with what biblical scholars refer to as the diaspora. And all that simply means is it's the time that they refer to when the Jews were scattered abroad the earth. We are living in a time where we see Ezekiel's vision of the bones and the valley coming together, where the flesh grew on. That is symbolizing Israel becoming a nation. Today, when we look back to Babylon, that's when they were first scattered as a nation. Not only were they in two different kingdoms, Judah and Israel, but they were taken separately into exile. Some went into Egypt, were taken into Egypt, and that's why we, Mary and Joseph, had a place to flee into Egypt when it came time to the time of Jesus Christ. There was a colony or a settlement already established down there of the Jews. Some went into Assyria, if I remember correctly, and others went into Babylon. Would someone please read Daniel chapter 1 and verse 1? Daniel 1 1.
first thing on chapter 5, but you don't have to. But there we find Eli, Hophni, and Phineas. And what do Hophni and Phineas do? They take the ark of God, the throne of God on the earth, into battle. And what do the Philistines do once they overtake the Israelites and they defeat them? They take the ark of God back to their homeland. And we find that they place it in the temple of Dagon. Just while we're here, a side note. We've got to keep in mind that heathen nations will worship any god they feel is beneficial to them. If they think it's a real god, they will serve them. Just And they will do what they have to to appease their anger. And that's just some of the characteristics because they fear their god. They, they serve their gods out of fear. We serve God out of love. Moving on from that side note, Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple there in Jerusalem. So when the temple is destroyed and they take artifacts back, what are they necessarily taking? Those things that are in the temple itself. We'll learn when we do our study, I want to do a character study on Belshazzar, that grand old feast that he was having. What were the vessels and cups and stuff that they were using? Where were they from? The temple in Jerusalem. That's where they got them. How does this play into end time events? Well, what are the Jews trying to do right now? What are one of their main pushes? They're trying to reconstruct something. Not necessarily Jerusalem, but what did Jeshua, as Brother Josh taught the other week in Sunday school, what were they trying to reconstruct? Besides the walls, brother. They were focusing on something else. The temple. The temple is crucial to Jewish life. So what do they need for the temple? Not necessarily, but what are they still looking for? But what would they need? The Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant. Do we know where the Ark of the Covenant currently is located? Nope. No, we don't. We have, I should say we don't have any clue. There are lots of different theories. Some people claim that Solomon had a son of the Queen of Sheba, and he sent it home back to Ethiopia with him. However, if you look at depictions of when the temple was ransacked by Nebuchadnezzar, there is a box with poles being carried by four men, along with what appears to be the golden candlestick in the background. Did Nebuchadnezzar take the Ark of the Covenant from the temple and take it back to Babylon? We don't know. But without the Ark of the Covenant, where are they supposed to uh, sprinkle the blood? Now, if we look at the Jews today, they have come up with substitutions. They've done that throughout all of history. The temple is no longer intact, so they will wave a rooster on a string over their head saying a prayer, hoping for the atonement of their sins. They have made substitutions. If I'm not mistaken, in Ezekiel's temple, which is the temple that will be constructed here, um, either in the tribulation period, prior to the tribulation period, it will be the one in use. If I'm not mistaken, there is a throne set up in the Holy of Holies. So, it, will the Ark of the Covenant be found? Will it be used in the temple? Or did God take it directly up to heaven himself? Because we do see it in the book of Revelation, the Ark before the throne. So what we're studying here branches out of all kinds of spectrums. Babylon plays a great role in end time events. And this is the beginning of the times of the Gentiles. Babylon was the capital of ten different dynasties in Mesopotamia. And it is considered the birthplace of writing and literature. The writing style would be that, what they refer to as cuneiform. Basically, the letters all have to look like triangles at the points. It had one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Can anyone tell me what that was? Uh, 
Garden. The Hanging Gardens. And when you look at the Hanging Gardens, it was fed by the Euphrates River, which ran through the city itself. And finally, in 539 B.C., it was, would be that river that would lead to the downfall of the city. Now we'll continue a little bit on. Just a little bit of review from what we studied at the very, very beginning of our lesson, of our series. The word he, uh, the Hebrew word for Babylon is Babel. And much to our unsurprise, it's the exact same word used to describe or used for Babel, the city of Babel. It means confusion. It can refer to the empire or the city, but it means confusion. It occurs in 233 verses of the Old Testament, and it is mentioned 263 times in Scripture. Babylon itself, that is. 13 of which are in the New Testament. Now there are alternative names to Babylon. Once again, just for review, the first one being, which was the first city we talked about, and Rod built it, Babel. Then you have Babylon. You have Shishak. You have Shinar. In Revelation chapter 17 and verse 5, it is referred to as Babylon the Great. If someone would please read Revelation 17, 5. If someone else would find Revelation 19, 2, and just hold it. Revelation 19, 2. We actually find two names for Babylon mentioned in 17, 5. So Babylon is referred to as Babylon the Great and the mother of harlots and abominations in the earth. What about Revelation 19 and verse 2? For the So she's referred to as the great poor in Revelation 19 and verse 2. Now just moving on to the symbols for Babylon. Does anybody remember what symbols might be used for Babylon taken from the dreams of Daniel or the visions of Daniel? Or even Nebuchadnezzar? What did we talk about last week? The great image. Do you remember which portion of the image represented Babylon? The head of gold. So Babylon is represented in Daniel chapter 2, verse 38, as the head of gold. What does Daniel chapter 7, 2 through 4, how does that describe Babylon? Daniel 7, 2 through 4. statue or an image. 
and he revealed them to Daniel in the form of beasts. And as a side note, it shows us that man beholds nations as something great, luxurious, grand, but to God they're nothing but dreaded, fierce beasts fighting one another. He mentioned the great sea. Does anybody remember from our studies a long time ago, I realized, what the great sea is? It's a physical sea. It is the Mediterranean Sea. So Daniel saw these beasts rise out of the Mediterranean Sea. And he described one as having, as being a lion with eagle's wings. And we want to get in more detail. This here is a description of Babylon. A lion being the king of the jungle. We think of majesty. We think of beauty. We think of fierceness. And that's exactly how Babylon was in her day. She was grand. She was luxurious. There was no city that could really rival her. The eagle's wings depict how fast the kingdom spread, how fast it grew, how the armies just took over area by area through diplomacy. It talks about how swiftness, how swift the kingdom was. And the fact that it's an eagle, the eagle is the king of the air. So it wasn't rugged, it wasn't brutish, it wasn't, it wasn't like me, it wasn't messy. If I were, I'd make a big old mess. But Babylon moved with grandeur and splendor. The way that she conquered an area or took over, just the way she presented herself. It was grand, it was luxurious. It was like nothing ever seen before that would come after her. We talk about it is also represented by the body of a lion with ink with ink eagle's wings and the head of a man. If you go over to I think it was in the Louvar in France where I seen it. It was either that or the British Museum. They actually had a setup of in the Babylonian structure of what they would call the guardians of the gate. And what it was was the body of a lion had eagle's wings depicted on it, and the head of a man. In Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 5, Revelation chapter 17 and 12 as well, Babylon is depicted and described as two women. In Revelation chapter 12, Babylon is represented as being clothed with light, no name, standing on the moon. And finally, in Revelation chapter 17, Babylon is decked in counterfeit adorning and has a name sitting on a beast. Now let's get down to the location. Where is what current nation is Babylon in? Of the city itself. 
It had, a, it had brick walls, which were about 60 miles in circumference, 75 to 87 feet wide, so they weren't thin walls, they were grand. And 300 to 350 feet high. They were 25 feet thick, and they had another wall 75 feet behind the first wall. The first wall extended 35 feet into the below ground, so it had a good anchor. So why would they build two walls like that? Well, if you came in with battering rams or so forth to try to conquer the city, you would take down the first wall, but then you still had to get through the second wall. So you had room for the first wall to fall down, but that wasn't enough, that still gave it time, they still had a little bit of protection. The first wall wasn't going to take out the second wall. It had 250 towers that were 450 feet high. The city was centered by a hundred brazen gate, was entered by a hundred brazen gates, 25 on each side. Eight massive gates led to the inner city and a hundred brass gates were around that. Not only did it have large walls, but a trench or a moat ran around the walls. They had roads which ran from one gate to the opposing gates. And it wasn't just dirt, but the roads, the streets were paved with stone slabs that were three foot square. Of course, there were countless houses and gardens that were created on these paths. So it had a layout to it. It wasn't just random buildings, but it was almost like a modern city planning. In fact, our modern city day, our modern day city planning do, does go all the way back to Mesopotamia, to this area to begin with. Nebuchadnezzar's palace, which was one of the grand features of the city, or one of the grand architectural feats of the city, was contained within a six mile enclosure. Within the city itself were the hanging gardens. They were created on an artificial mound or man-made mound that stood 400 feet high, sustained by arches upon arches, terraced off for trees and flowers, and the water itself was drawn from with machinery which took the water from the Euphrates River itself which ran through the city. It was the capital of a grand, vast empire. And with, we know the Jews were in, in Babylonian captivity for how many years, according to Jeremiah? Seventy years. The most famous gate of the Babylonian city is the Ishtar Gate. I think it's on display in Germany right now, if I remember correctly. The most famous temple was the Temple of Murdoch. I'm just trying to see. It's not necessarily listed on your Babylonian handout, but if you looked at the center at number three, that would be their ziggurat. Uh, we'll talk about that here in a second. But the temple would be just south and to the right of it on your paper. Or if you want to look at it in terms of geography, it would be southwest. South. Yeah, southwest. And as you see there, the river Euphrates ran right through the middle of the city. In fact, ferry boats would run on this river and they had drawbridges that would extend a half mile over it. And the drawbridges would close at night. There was a golden image of Baal and the golden table, both weighing over 5,000 pounds of solid gold. And I apologize, I messed up on this number Q there. I think it's supposed to be one golden line and a solid gold figure that stood 18 feet high. The founding of the city itself took place probably somewhere between 1792 and 1740, and it was founded by Hammurabi, who was an Amorite prince. Why is that important? Because modern-day legislative takes the roots all the way back to Hammurabi and 
is for. That code, this is the founding of modern day law. And once, as I just talked about a little bit, he issued laws and codes, and this is, uh, this is the foundation of our modern day legislation. And the kingdom itself, Hammurabi.